Hi, and welcome to No Essential Library's educational platform for the presentation of research and ideas to support uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. My name is Lisa Clark, and I'm your host from the Nash NOAA Central Library. Today's library seminar is titled The Sport of Ensemble Modeling. The presentation is part of the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series, which is developed by NOAA Fisheries and organized by Kristen Blackheart. Today's speaker, Dr. Liz Brooks, will be introduced by Kristen. Before I hand over the mic, here are a few housekeeping items for your consideration. If you have trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, we suggest that you log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and usually resolves most technical issues. Our presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. I'll add the link to our channel to the chat box. We're very interested in your questions, and we encourage you to ask them throughout the seminar, even though the speaker will not address them until the end of her presentation. All audience members are muted, so type your questions or comments in the chat box under questions, located in the control panel of GoToWebinar. To our live audience participants, we encourage you to fill out the quick survey at the end of the webinar. The library wants to learn more about what you would like to see in the future. So with that last detail, let's get started. The mic is yours, Kristen. Thanks, Lisa. Our speaker today comes to us from the Northeast Fishery Science Center. Liz is a stock assessment scientist whose research interests include simulation testing and development of stock assessment methods. Um, like many of us, Liz spent a lot more time on screens during quarantine. Um, but unlike some of us, she actually put that time to good use, and we'll hear a little bit about that during her presentation today. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Liz. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to share this work. And to the audience, thank you for finding time in your week for yet another virtual meeting. We all have plenty of those these days. What I'm gonna be presenting today uh, is actually expanding on some simulation work that was presented at the National Stock Assessment Workshop all the way back in 2018. I can't believe it's been three years since that meeting, but a lot has happened in those three years. For example, the pandemic happened. A lot of our normal activities shifted, and as Kristen just noted, a lot of us found ourselves with lots and lots of extra screen time. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I found inspiration in unexpected places, like sports and the informative scoring summaries that fit onto your phone screen. Like this, or this, or this, this one, this one, and this. So we'll look at something like this a little bit later in the talk. The goals of this presentation today, first I wanna introduce ensemble models, then I'll describe the simulation study, then I'll evaluate the performance of two different case studies under different weighting schemes and different on, ensemble sets. Then I'll borrow some visual, visualization summaries from a popular sports app. Finally, I'll conclude by highlighting important decisions and considerations and discuss unresolved questions and future research directions. Keeping with the sports theme, what's the trash talk about the status quo approach? Well, the approach there is to take a single best model and use that to give management advice. Sometimes, however, the winner isn't very clear cut. It's a close game. You can think of it as overtime or extra innings, penalty shots or penalty kicks. This can be problematic when the fit and diagnostics are reasonably close between models, but the scale of those models and or the stock status are very different. In these cases, advice probably doesn't adequately reflect uncertainty and risk, and the advice may be inaccurate. We can think about the status quo approach as first identifying the model type based on the data that we have available. Then we think about a few different structures that we want to explore, perhaps some different parameterizations of those structures. And throughout this process, what we have is a winnowing of potential models uh, based on model fit, diagnostics, 
until at the end of the process, we end up with a single base model. We're all pretty familiar with this process. It looks a lot like this, happens every year. Madness doesn't even come close to describing the level of excitement. So one of the criticisms here, the trash talk, is that uncertainty is not carried forward. So what are those pieces of uncertainty? Here, the solid black line would represent our base model. These thinner dashed lines might reflect alternative models that were considered in the stock assessment process, but based on model diagnostics and model selection criteria, they get left behind. So the results that we present, in this case for spawning stock biomass time series, just reflect the reality represented by the base model. The alternative realities reflected by these dashed lines don't get carried along. This then impacts our uncertainty and stock status among potential assessment models because it just reflects the solid black line. Similarly, when we make forecasts, we tend to just use one forecast model, but there may be uncertainty in the structure of those forecast models as well. And maybe from a given assessment model, we should be looking at multiple forecasts. So uncertainty in the forecast, considering one, but there could be many there. And then similarly, each of these sensitivity models that weren't included would each have their own forecast models. So there's uncertainty in a given model's forecast and uncertainty across the suite of models and their forecasts. On the other side of the coin, what's the hype about model ensembles? Well, they claim to be a better reflection of uncertainty. And since no model's right, you might increase your chances of bounding the true model if you include multiple models. This might help avoid misspecification error. It might provide more robust catch advice, maybe reduce your retro, and you might find reduced bias overall. For instance, if the ensemble members have bi-directional bias that cancels, you may have reduced variance. Again, this would happen if the candidate models have no or have negative correlation. Dormant et al. in 2018 is a pretty good reference to describing these different points. We can summarize the differences and similarities between ensemble models with this graphic. Similarity is that both modeling approaches, status quo and ensemble modeling, explore a number of different models. So a lot of the work for an ensemble modeling is already done in the status quo approach. The difference is for status quo, 100% of the model weight comes from a single model. And that's what goes into the advice. In a model ensembling approach, every model contributes to the advice and each model's advice is weighted based on some um, weighting metric. So next I wanna quickly describe the simulation study, uh, focus on the workflow, the operating model, the two case studies, one where I just add observation error to the simulated data, and one where I also add underreporting of catch. Then we'll go through ensemble models, looking at combinations of different parameterizations and structural choices. So this is the workflow. Step one was to simulate the data. So this timeline up here shows I simulated 75 years of data. The yellow highlighting is for the last 46 years, and that's the data that I passed to the estimation models. Step two was to define candidate assessment models. And then step three is to fit each of those candidate assessment models to a subset of the simulated time series. That subset again was this yellow highlighted area. So each model's fit, then I explore different weighting methods to obtain, to obtain the ensemble assessment. Then I calculate reference points for each candidate model and then stock status for each candidate model. And then apply the same weighting schemes up here in step four to obtain the ensemble stock status. So steps three through six, the assessment happens three times in this yellow time period. And in between each of those are forecasts. 
So just like the assessment model, I define a set of candidate forecast models, make the forecasts with each forecast model from each assessment model, and then within each assessment model, I calculate forecast performance based on a quantity of interest. Next, I weight the forecasts within an assessment model by performance weights, and then between assessment models, I apply the assessment weighting scheme to get the ensemble forecast. For this talk, I'm just focusing on the assessment part, so I'll be looking at the assessments at step one, two, and three. You can think of them as assessment updates. So the operating model setup, the life history is patterned after a typical generic gadoid. Um, we have fishery selectivity imposed uh, that is shifted to the right of the maturity ogive, and there are two index uh, indices in the model. Their selectivity is shown in the bottom right panel. And the 10 is highlighted to show that the, uh, the model has 10 ages, a plus group of 10. I simulate a pretty strong um, contrasting pattern for fishing mortality. Again, the years that are passed to the estimation models are highlighted in yellow. And the last 10 years of fishing are at F40. On the right, you can see what that fishing pattern, um, the impact on spawning biomass in the solid blue line, recruitment in the light blue bars, and the catch at age, and the total biomass of the population. The indices, there were two of those, and you can see those here. Again, yellow shading is what's passed to the estimation model. And then the catch series, as I indicated, there are two cases considered. Case one is red, just observation error. Case two, for the last half of the catch in the estimation models, I scale it by a uniform random number between 0.4 and 0.7. So that imposes un, uh, misreporting, but it's not a consistent scale of misreporting. Each year is different. So drafting the ensemble team. The first question is what constitutes an ensemble? So this graphic is trying to show that there are multiple levels and I think the answer to what constitutes an ensemble can depend on who you ask and also the discipline that you're referring to. At the most basic level here at the bottom, you can think of an ensemble over different initial conditions. Moving up a layer, you can think of a model as ensembled across different parameters. For example, natural mortality or growth. A third level, we have different model structures. So the form of selectivity, the stock recruit function, number of fleets, and at the top level is the algorithm. This could be a VPA, a surplus production model, statistical catch at age, etc. For this simulation, I've highlighted the ensemble that's being considered. So there's one algorithm. These are all done in ASAP. There are six structures. There are, based on selectivity, there are two types, either dome or flat and three types of stock recruit function. Lastly, there are six fixed values of natural mortality, constant across all ages and all years. This gives us a total of 36 ensemble members. This table shows the, um, the layout of each of the models in the ensemble. The first six are just across natural mortality, which ranges from 0.15 to 0.5. In each of those cases, both the fishery and the index has flat selectivity, and the stock recruit function is a Beverton Holt. The next six, the only difference is that the indices are now, instead of flat, domed. If we expand and look at the next 12, Again, we repeat the same six natural mortalities, dome, uh, flat topped and domed, and now we consider a Ricker stock recruit function. And then the last 12 have the same factors of M, flat versus domed selectivity, 
and then a stock recruitment with mean uh, a mean stock recruitment with just deviations. This last row in the table in light green is showing what the true value is. The true model is not part of the ensemble. That's by design. Um, basically, we want to be evaluating how the model weights um, produce uh, different ensemble results. And if we had the true model in there, presumably that would get most of the weight and that would probably skew our perception of how the different weighting schemes perform. So the true model is not in the set, but its configuration looks most like uh, it's bounded basically by models three and four. So let's look at some results. I'm going to go through time series of estimates, both absolute and stock status, look at model weights by weighting metric and by composition of the ensemble. Then we'll look at uncertainty estimates and ask are they better than the status quo and is the true OM value within the confidence interval. Lastly, we'll look at the retrospective pattern. So these are time series for spawning stock biomass. The left two plots are when there are six models, so just the natural mortality, different models in the ensemble. On the right are 12 models, so it's the different natural mortality rates, and then the factor of whether selectivity was flat or domed. Then we also have the facet, which is either case one or case two, and case two had the underreporting imposed for the last 23 years. So comparing case one with case two, you see the difference in scale that happens with the un, uh, misreported catch. Comparing um, the left side here, the six models with the right side where there are 12 models, you'll notice that the, going from left to right, six to 12 models, that you really haven't explored much more of the solution space by including uncertainty and selectivity you still have basically the same six natural mortalities uh, with a little bit of extra wiggle depending on you know, which mortality rate was assumed and how much doming was then estimated in the model. Similarly, adding in um, another 12 models that account for the different stock recruit function being a bricker or adding in also the mean recruitment with deviations you're still seeing basically the initial six clusters. This kind of begs the question of whether we have model redundancy, um, whether we should be concerned about the weights being distributed uh, or a certain configuration getting to more weight than it deserves because it's overrepresented, but I'll come back to that later. Now looking at the time series for the F multiplier, we see the same pattern. The initial six models uh, on the left here are basically repeated when we add in the other factors in the ensemble. Similarly, at the end of the time series between case one and two, we see that F is estimated to be much lower on, in case two with underreporting than in case one. And here are those same plots for 24 and 36 models in the ensemble. So there's a lot of lines on those plots, and the goal of the ensemble modeling approach is to combine those. Um, and in order to do that, we need weights to combine the different time series into a single estimate. So which weight is most appropriate, and how different is the outcome? Here's one way to look at model weights. What I've plotted here is for a given model, model one through model six, the weight that is assigned to it based on 11 different possible weighting criteria. Now this is case one, and when I was showing the uh, different factors, the table of different factors uh, that were used to design the different um, ensemble candidates, I highlighted that models three and four bound the true model. And that's good to know because models three and four get most of the weight when we look at the information criteria type of weighting metrics. Models one and six, which have respectively the lowest and the highest M, uh, tend to get the, the lowest scores um, if we're looking at the fit 
uh, AIC type of diagnostic. And the remaining model uh, weights from equal weight to MSE and cross-validation. There's not a whole lot of difference there. They're all pretty similar to the equal weight. Another way to look at this is to look at a given weight metric and then see how the weights are assigned across models. So here again, we see models three and four getting the most weight. We can also look at equal weighting. That's In this case, there are six models, so they each get a score of one over six. And there are slight differences in the MSEs and the cross-validation. We can look at how those weights change between assessment updates. So three years of data are added between model assessment model one, uh, the update two, and update three. And then we can look at how those weights change when we go from having six models in the ensemble to 12 models in the ensemble. Most obviously equal weight, they're now each getting one twelfth instead of one sixth. Um, these are all still again pretty similar to the equal weighting and we see a little the same tension between fits to the index and fits to the catch if we were to just focus on those components uh, of the AIC score. Going to 36, I think these clusters reflect the same uh, the same six models that we saw initially. When you add the additional models, they're all kind of falling in the same trajectory as those initial six natural mortality um, models. Looking at case two now, models three and four don't get any weight. Um, which means case two with the underreported catch is not capturing, not giving any weight to the true uh, to the true model. And in fact, it's giving more of the weight to models 10 and 11 in this case when there are 12 models in the ensemble. Uh, these would be models that have domed selectivity and the higher natural mortality values. So that's not surprising. If there's missing catch, then the model needs a way to explain what happened to those fish that the indices think should be there. Um, and two of the ways it can do that is by increasing natural mortality or imposing a dome in the selectivity. So going from 12 now to 24, again, you see the same repeating pattern. And similarly for 36. So a couple takeaways from the ensemble exploration of weights. For a given set of models, whether it be six or 12 or 36, the weighting metrics can be very different. For example, equal weights basically considers every, mo every model a winner. For AIC, Typically, there's one or very few winners. Some of the other uh, weighting metrics, MSE and cross-validation, the winner depends on the rule. Another weighting metric that I didn't include here, but I thought I would discuss, is expert or group judgment. First of all, I think that would be impossible to implement in a simulation study, but it's often talked about as an alternative approach to setting weights. Um, I think the problem with this in application would be transparency and repeatability. You can think of home court advantage here. Um, what could happen is that the models that are assigned by the expert group are completely dependent on who happens to be in the group that's assembled. Pick another day, pick another arena, you'd have a different group and different weights would be assigned. I think that's an undesirable situation. Um, you wouldn't want personnel to determine the outcome just because they picked weights that were different. Uh, I think we want to let the data and the model uh, speak for the, for, the, for the results. Another pattern that emerged was that for a given weighting metric, the weights for any individual model depends on the other models in the ensemble. So whether there were six or 36, that's obviously clear for the equal weighting situation but there were shifts among some of the other weighting criteria as well. 
third point is that the weights can change between assessment periods. And this has implications for how we think about assessment updates. So looking at reference points, uh, we have the SSB reference point on the x-axis, the F reference point on the y-axis, and case one and two side by side. And again, the same six clusters pretty well defined by the natural mortality rates. And then within that cluster is just shifting based on um, the selectivity that was assumed for the fleet and for the indices, as well as the stock recruit relationship. So putting this all together to get stock status, that's calculated by taking the SSB and the F trajectory from each model and dividing those by each model's reference points. Then to get the ensemble, it's a weighted average of each stock status trajectory using any of the different weight, weighting metrics that were calculated. So I then compare this ensemble stock status for different weight schemes. So this is the um, time series of ensemble estimates for spawning stock biomass, actually spawning stock biomass status. Uh, all 36 models are on there. The solid green line is the ensemble median when applying equal weights. The dark blue line, the thick dark blue line is the ensemble median when you apply AIC weights. And the same for uh, the status of overfishing. Green is, dark green is equal weights and the solid thick blue is the AIC weights. So you see that they follow um, the models that were identified by the different weights, very different scale between case one and two driven by the uh, imposed underreporting. And likewise, the F status is different at the end of the time series. What about uncertainty bounds? So in the blue shaded polygon, we have the 95% confidence intervals based on AIC weights. And in green, we have the uncertainty bounds based on equal weighting. The yellow circle is the true stock status. And so for case one, we see that both weighting approaches, uh, the median was pretty close to unbiased, and the true value is contained in both confidence intervals. On the right side, neither of the medians is accurate. They're both biased, and only in the bottom percent percentiles of equal weighting is the true value actually contained. Same conclusion for the F status. Um, for case one, both medians were pretty close to unbiased, and both confidence intervals contain the true value. Not so for case two. Again, both approaches were biased, and only in the equal weighting, again, in the tail, was the true value contained. So how do the ensembles perform with retrospective analysis? So what I want to compare here is, Moan's row for each model, in this case, one through six. This is for SSB, and this is for F. And on the right side, this is the Moan's row for SSB for each different weighting metric. And same thing, each different weighting metric for F. And this is for case one. So model four in the single status quo approach had the, had the best fit, it had a very low Moan's row. As you deviate from model four, you get bigger retros, and only at the really model one and six would you start to be approaching something that might be considered major. Same thing down here for F. Almost no retro, very minor retro for many of the other models, and more of a major retro for models one and six. Despite the difference in how the, um, the magnitude of the weights for each of these different scores, all of the estimates of Moan's row would be considered negligible to minor. That's true for SSB as well as F. K1 
case two, same situation. So the best model identified was six, if we were just looking at one. Um, you see the scale here now goes up to 0.75, and for F, down to negative 0.4. Those are the scales we would expect to see for a major retrospective when we imposed uh, misreporting. This is the result that was anticipated. And yet, when we weight all of these six models, regardless of the weighting scheme, the row is substantially reduced, and in most cases, I would consider them to be minor. Same for F. Looking at case one now, we've got 12 different models here. And again, you see just the, the mirroring of the first six uh, by the second six models. Again, doesn't matter what weighting scheme you use, the retrospective pattern is very minor for SSB as well as for F. Case two, again, the first six models and the second six models have pretty similar patterns. And then again, regardless of the weighting metric that's applied, all of the retrospective patterns are reduced to most likely minor, maybe a couple of these are approaching major uh, adjustment. So now I wanna get into some visualizations. Um, in the status quo approach, we tend to look at very detailed fits to every data set. Pages and pages and pages of plots. How can we get an informative overview without drowning in plots? Because now we're moving not just from one model, but to six or 36 or who knows how many. This is where I borrow some sports analytic summaries. For example, if you look at the final score on your sports app, it's just a snapshot, tells you what the final result of the game was. However, this team stats can show what made the difference in getting to that final score. So how can we translate to ensemble team stats? Well, what I'm showing here would be considered like a final score. It's the negative log likelihood for six models, if my ensemble just included those six candidate models. But I can also think of the team stats that make up those scores. So what I'm showing here with each row is the assessment model. And there were three assessments that occurred. The final column is the total. Previous columns are each of the components that add up to the total. And the scale on the x-axis is actually showing the delta negative log likelihood. So I've identified the minimum in each of these columns across the models. So that's a zero. And then each of these bars reflects the, the difference, how much greater negative log likelihood was compared to the minimum. So here we saw this echoes what we saw previously. Models three and four uh, performed very well. Um, models six and one performed the worst. And we could just scan back to the left here at these columns and say, which, which of the fits here are driving this total result? And in particular, looking at the scale of the x-axis will help us see which ones are important or have a very small scale. So that's for case one. Same thing for case two. Remember this picked model six as the best. Model five was close. And these are pretty much the opposite of what we saw for case one. That's driven by, again, the misreporting that was imposed. And you can look across, again, the different categories and the scale of the x-axis to see which is really driving it. And in this case, it's mostly the fit to the index total. And you can compare that scale to what we saw up here. Another graphic that I think is pretty, pretty useful is the game flow. So again, 
we can look at the final score. It's just a snapshot and it tells us that Dallas won. But the game flow gives details of when the lead changed. So although Dallas won, it was losing for most of the game. We'd have a different winner depending on when the clock stops. And this is not unlike assessment updates. We add more years of data at the end of each update and the model winner may change. For example, at the end of the first quarter, if we stopped the clock then, LA would have won. And in fact, if we would have stopped the clock at any point in the second quarter or the third quarter or the first half of the fourth quarter, LA would have won. So how can we translate that to our model ensembles? Again, just looking at six models, these are the different categories, the final scores, if you will. And here's the model flow. So again, this is a cumulative, cumulative sum of the difference in the total negative log likelihood. Smaller is better. And you can see as we make an incremental change, which is add one more year of data, how those totals are diverging. In the first assessment model, we have a, a pack that's running pretty tight here. Model six is not even in contention. There's a few lead changes, <clears throat> and even model one is still in the running, perhaps. Three more years of data added. Model one gets left in the dust, and we've just got this pack of three here. Add three more years of data for the third assessment, and now there's some separation, and it's really just neck and neck between models three and four. Same thing for case two. We see a lot of lead changes down here. Now the best models are five and six, the models with higher natural mortality rates. Clear separation from the models with lower Ms. That's models one, two, and three. And we continue to get separation uh, through all three, separate, all three assessment models. Um, and both of models five and six are performing pretty similarly. There's a lot of lead changes in this, uh, the last 10 years here. We can drill down into the case two a little more. Remember looking at the uh, team scores or the ensemble team scores, it was primarily the fit to the index total that was driving the differences among the models. So I'm showing the similar thing here, lower is better. These dashed lines show when the catch report misreporting started in the simulated data. And I think that's, you know, a couple years from there is when you really start to see the divergence and, you know, most likely the accumulation of uh, residuals where the index is not being fit well. One more <clears throat> um, graph that I want to borrow from baseball this time are these three by three grids showing hitting averages. And I think that's a nice way to summarize stock status across model ensemble groupings and model ensemble weightings. So I've got two different ways of looking at that. Just to orient you here, I've got case one and two for assessment update one, case one and two. This is for the third assessment update. Across the bottom are the different uh, in this case, four of the different weighting schemes. And going up the side here is the ensemble composition. So there are 12 models in this row, 24 in this row, and 36 in this row. And then each tile is the median of SSB over SSB reference point in the terminal year. So looking here on the left, all of these are greater than one. In fact, they're greater than 0.5, um, so there's stock would not be considered overfished. Um, going up the column, we see that these values are all very similar, which again gets back to the earlier point I made about how the models cluster, whether we have some redundancy. And this might suggest when you have virtually no difference going up a column that you could collapse the ensemble down to a smaller subset. Going across the rows here, 
these three weighting metrics are giving virtually the same median and a slight difference between the equal weights. This is a comfortable result. I think if we saw big color differences like here, then we'd be concerned because then the choice of the weighting metric would really drive the result. For instance, if we had not overfished here and overfished here, that'd be a really difficult decision to say which one is the most appropriate to use. Compared to uh, case two, the scales are different. We saw that when we looked at the ensemble um, uh, plot with the uncertainties. But we have the same pattern, which is that going up a column, we see the same values, again, model redundancy, and going across columns. These first three are giving us the same, but the scale is a bigger difference here between equal weight and the AIC totals. Whether that's an indication of bias, because um, we saw that the results for case two were biased, uh, I can't say. I think more study is required, but so far I like this as kind of an overview picture. And the same results hold over here for assessment update three. We've got constancy up and down the column. Across the rows is pretty consistent. And then case two, we start to see a difference among uh, the weighting schemes. This last picture so here I showed in the, each tile the median. This last picture now is what fraction of the total distribution is greater than F ref. So if I think about a probability distribution, how much of that is above F reference point? So here for case one, it's showing that roughly 50% is above by inference, about 50% is below. That's a good result because actually the last 10 years that were simulated were simulated with fishing at F ref. This model is telling us that we're basically straddling F reference point. The distribution is centered on F MSY. Case two is not telling us that. It's saying that we're well below. No part of the distribution is above F ref. Uh, that might lead managers to conclude that we could increase F and set higher catch rates. So post game, let's revisit the hype. Are ensembles a better reflection of uncertainty? I think that requires us to define better. This was simulated so we can evaluate coverage of the true value by these different distributions, but we wouldn't be able to do that in real cases. And I think to some extent, what we consider better uh, depends on how we implement our control rules, how we adjust probabilities, what percentile we use for status determination. What about bounding the true model? Yes for case one, no for case two. Only one of the weighting metrics explored covered the true value. Can we avoid misspecification? Well, for this simulation, the answer is yes for case one, no for case two. What about retro reduction? Well, yes, for both case one and case two, especially compared to each individual model. However, bias persisted in the ensemble estimates for case two. Most likely, this is because the underlying structural uncertainty was not reflected in the ensemble members. So these are some discussion points on challenges that I see moving to an ensemble approach to stock assessment. In a status quo approach, we spend a lot of time in the weeds ensuring that the model works. We check for convergence. We look at the final gradient, positive definite Hessian, boundary solutions, try to make sure parameters aren't confounded, look at sensitivity to initial conditions, residual patterns, and retrospective patterns. How does this scale for ensembles? It's gonna be a heavy lift. The workload scaler is probably exponential, and this is just going through the assessment aspect. The same considerations would be there for the projections, what I call the forecast interval. The output to generate as well as examine is also exponential. We can automate some of these steps, 
You can write functions to set up, to run, and to summarize the ensembles. Some of the convergence problems we can identify um, and automate that identification, but then what action do we take? We can't examine and fix individual models because it's very time consuming. I attempted that for this simulation. The alternative is we just drop non-converged runs, but there's a risk there that you throw out a good model simply because the initial setup was poor. So I think there's more consideration needed for this aspect. We also have to think about what are the expectations for reviewers? How many pages are in that PDF package that they get to review? And how many days or weeks is it going to take for them to get through? And then is there anything, is there such a thing as a simple update after this? Would we update the weighting metrics as we saw they change through time when new data is added? Do we keep the same set of ensemble models or do we add new, new ensemble members? if we become aware of a new aspect of uncertainty. Further questions in future work, there's clearly some interplay between the candidate model set and the weighting metric. Does it make sense to restrict the model set to a reasonable size or go for the kitchen sink approach? Maybe we need a play-in game. We could try to limit our, our set by identifying key axes of uncertainty but this is challenging because marine systems are difficult to observe. We could always just fall back on the usual suspects here, sort of like I did with M, different selectivities, different stock recruit functions. But each species might have its own peculiar uh, axes of uncertainty to explore. Equal weighting here would seem to argue for a more exclusive set because every model is gonna get the same weight. So you probably wanna limit and exclude ridiculous models. AIC might converge to the status quo if the difference in negative log likelihood is not small among models. I mentioned concerns about redundant models. In this particular simulation, it just seems like the weights ascribed in the ensemble when there were six measures were then just split up to the same type of model configuration when I went from six to 12 and then from 6 to 18 to 24 to 36. Maybe that's not a problem, but I wouldn't want to make a strong inference based on this one simulation. Finally, would you ever want or need to model ensemble across different modeling algorithms, surplus production uh, and statistical catch at age? That would be very challenging and you'd have to find common units, I think, to be able to combine the different different variables and different outputs coming from each algorithm. So in other words, I would say we need more simulation testing and this feedback loop between apply, applying to real case studies to help us identify specific problems and then circle back for more simulation testing so that we can design specific test cases for those problems that we've identified. Lastly, I think more explanation more exploration of the performance of model weighting schemes. Is there a reasonable default recommendation or is the best weighting metric situation dependent? I think experience will help build best practice. I'll end with one last sports visual that actually has nothing to do with ensemble models, but looking at these shot charts and the preponderance of three point attempts, the visual similarity with closed areas is striking, at least to me. So I'll thank you all for your attention. I promised a bad pun and here it is. I'll let you mull it over and let me know if you have any questions. And that's my bad pun doing the shimmy. That I concludes love it. my talk. Thank you so much, Liz, that was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I love, I love puns, so. Um, audience, we have about 11 minutes to answer your questions, so please type them in the questions chat box, and I'm going to read them to Liz. Uh, we did have a couple of people ask some questions throughout the uh, your your presentation, uh, Liz. So let me get started with those. Um, this first question is is actually multiple questions, so please feel free to ask me to slow down or repeat anything. Um, it asks, you point out MSE 
as a way to select weightings, but MSE is mainly about articulating the trade-offs noted by performance indicators. Also, where do PEDs in, enter in? And finally, shouldn't ensembles be better used as a method for conditioning and specifying operating models to test more transparent and simple approaches to catch advice, as ensembles for annual catch advice will, will never, in my humble opinion, be appropriate for providing transparent catch advice. That was a long question. It, um, it is. So please feel free to ask me to, to read parts of it. Yeah, I, I was just hoping I could look in. I, my chat is blank, so I was hoping I could oh, read it. Yeah, uh, let me go ahead and, and uh, if you want to go ahead and start answering the question, I will put that in your chat. <laughs> I actually need to see the question. No problem. Let's, one second. Okay, I sent it to you. Great, I see it now, thanks. Okay, no problem. so. I see the way to select it. Okay, so I need this person to define PEDs and shouldn't ensembles be better used as a method for conditioning operating models? Um, I can actually go on. Uh, if the yeah. uh, person who asked that question wants to, to uh, you know, give us some more information, go ahead and do that. And meanwhile, I'm going to ask another question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, this next one says, uh, is there anything in Magnuson that limits the ability to use ensemble models for either status determination or management advice? I mean, nothing jumps to mind because I don't think a s single model is directly implied um, in Magnuson. Someone else can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I don't believe there's anything in Magnuson that explicitly says it has to be a single species model or it cannot be an ensemble. Meanwhile, um, um, the person who asked the earlier question has responded said, and said, uh, performance enhancing drugs was a, <laughs> <laughs> was, was a joke part sandwich between two actually questions. Sorry, that, that's great. Yeah, that's funny. I was thinking about performance enhancing um, penalties um, and how that would inhibit, I think, um, ensembling across models that, for instance, where you impose different fixed weights um, for effective sample size. And um, I just decided not to go down that, that joke path. Um, yeah, well, as far as how broadly ensemble models will be applied and whether they'll be appropriate for providing annual catch advice, um, whether it's something we can operationalize. You know, I think I think it's just the, the next great thing. You know, for a while there it was MSEs and everybody just said, well, we can solve this problem with an MSE. And now it's, well, this is a challenge, but we can solve it with an ensemble. So I think there may be situations where you do have close models um, that are not easy to distinguish. And so, you know, the way of thinking about it right now is it may be reserved for special situations and not operationalized. Um, but I'm certainly willing to continue exploring best practice for when we do implement that. Um, yeah. Okay, excellent. That's, yeah, that's all I have to say on that. Okay, no problem. Uh, we have getting, we're getting some more questions. Um, this next question asks, can you describe more how these mo methods could be used for models built with different assessment programs slash methods? Can the same weighting process be used? Well, I think it's a challenge because, you know, for instance, a surplus production model, you just have the single total um, index, for example, and the total catch, whereas for a statistical catch at age, you also have the age comps and whatever else, whatever other parameters you may be estimating, stock recruit function. Um, so in those cases, you know, I think people talk about 
equal weighting or something like cross-validation um, is maybe avoiding the fact that they have different data. Um, so you might be able to get scores or weights based on their performance, but then you still come down at the end of the day to how do I combine SSB from a statistical catch at age model and total B from a surplus production model. So those are different units and likewise the F multiplier from a statistical catch at age versus F mean very different things. So even if we can define a performance metric that we think might be a fair way to give weight to those different models, um, I think we'll still have a problem ultimately combining the outputs. Um, but you know, if, if someone else has attempted this, I'd love to hear about it. Excellent. Um, a couple more questions are coming in. This one asks, ensemble in the climate model seems to be most useful when the initial conditions are random and small changes may be influential and when model algorithm algorithms are very different. Do you think you've study fully explore, your study fully explores those range of possibilities? Well, here, um, as I showed in the um, little graphic, maybe I can just go back to that. The, um, I did consider initial conditions as part of this ensemble approach. Let's see, here it is. I, I skipped this because um, I feel like that's right in climate models. You do have, you know, these kind of chaotic dynamics and that's an important component. Whereas in our assessment realm, I feel like this sensitivity to initial conditions is actually something you do to test the model um, uh, to make sure that it's converged. So we tend to jitter the initial conditions, make sure that the model returns to the same point that you've identified a global rather than a local minimum. I don't think you would want to average over initial conditions that gave different results because you'd presumably be averaging over, uh, like I just said, both global and local minima. So, you know, just like I said that the definition of an ensemble depends who you ask and what their discipline is, um, I think that's the same is true for whether or not you would include initial conditions as an ensemble you know, structural model component, or whether it's just part of your diagnostics for a given model run. Um, someone just added, if model type differs, one can use relative stock, and then also added status yeah. to combined model results. Yeah, that's true. Sorry, I just muted myself. Uh, another person asked, what about grossly inconsistent models that are equally weighted? You end up with bi-model distributions for outputs, which is why I am thinking about Big Eye Tuna in the EPO. Oh, because that happened. <laughs> well, so one of the discussion points that I ended with was um, whether we need to have a, kind of a more restrictive set or go for the kitchen sink, and in particular, I'll go back to that slide. Um, I highlighted in particular the equal weight um, as being problematic in that situation because you definitely want to avoid um, including any ridiculous models. But that actually may be hard to identify what is ridiculous a priori. Um, so, you know, whether you have a play in game, and by that, uh, I mean that you have a, a test run of the models that you're considering potentially on data that's simulated like what you have, your test case, um, and then based on those performances, you would include them in the model. And I'm not familiar with this big eye case that you're referring to. Um, presumably the models included reflected reasonable um, hypotheses about alternative states of reality. Um, but you know, I've certainly participated in an assessment where you couldn't resolve very clearly strong dome or flat top in the survey in the fleet, and that made a huge difference in the scale. 
Excellent. We, we did not ensemble model, but it would be ripe for that situation. And you will end up with probably a bimodal distribution. Um, that's why I think the control rule is, um, you know, another aspect of how you treat those distributions. And I think that might need to be revisited for ensembles. Excellent. We actually have a couple more questions, but I'm just going to ask one more. Um, and uh, for those who people who have sent questions, I promise to send them to Liz, uh, who can respond to them offline. Uh, this last question says, or actually it's a comment. It says, model flow is a great diagnostic in general. Thanks for showing this in such a clear way. Is model flow the official name for the diagnostic? I vote for Brooks flow. <laughs> um, yeah, we, could, we can work on the names later. <laughs> <laughs> and one last comment here, uh, the person who asked about the big eye models uh, says, the big eye models were based on a uh, quite reasonable hypothesis, asked John. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really big simulation studies going on out there. And um, so I think, you know, having a fora to explore this and give each other feedback and compare notes on how weighting schemes performed and how to handle these bimodal situations and the corresponding management advice um, yeah I think that's a that would be a good thing for the future excellent well thank you this has been wonderful and um, do or Kristen have any last comments before we end the presentation I do I, I guess I'll just thank everyone for their good questions and um, you know invite them to follow up with any you know remaining questions that we didn't get to um, there's my pun again. I'm just getting to the last slide with um, email for myself and John, my co-author. Excellent, thank you. Well, I uh, really appreciate your appreciated your presentation, and I actually love the puns, so appreciate that, Liz. And Kristen, thank you for organizing the National Stock Assessment Science Series. Um, audience, I am so glad you joined us for today's library seminar. NOAA Central Library is very proud to present the work of the NOAA community and its partners, and we hope you'll join us again for another National Stock Assessment Science Seminar, which we host every uh, th first Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So be well, and uh, I'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.